am more from a research uh, research background than an academic uh, background so i have tried to incorporate certain research aspects or you know experimental setups as such to help you you know understand better how exactly the common dna technology works my intention is also because as i understood in the orientation program the next week is going to be a hands on experience for you people so you should be able to understand certain experimental aspects in order to actually perform the uh, experiments on bench so i have combined both the theoretical background as well as the experiment details with a little bit of knowledge that i have gained myself with the 12 years of research experience that i had so with that um, you all know that biotechnology is basically trying to alter maybe whole organisms or even the products or the enzymes of a particular organism okay using biotechnological techniques to produce products okay which is of use to the society to the science to the field of medicine anything for that matter now under biotechnology there could be two most important domains which are being studied one is the genetic engineering and the other one is the bioprocess technology so genetic engineering is a methodology by which you basically alter or perturb the you know the normal structure of the dna or even the rna any one of the nucleic acids and then you introduce this altered <coughs> nucleic acid into any specific host which you are interested in expressing as a result of which you are ultimately bringing about a change in the phenotype of that particular cell <coughs> kindly excuse me i have a bit of uh, dry cough so so that is about the genetic engineering and the second most important aspect is the bioprocess engineering wherein you try to create a sterile ambience in the biotechnological processes to achieve the production of it may be antibiotics it may be vaccines etc on a larger scale okay that is bioprocessing engineering now where exactly does recombinant dna technology come under these two techniques if we look at it it will come under genetic engineering now the picture what is shown on my screen which i am sure is uh, is uh, visible these are actually the transgenic uh, zebra fishes which is through the technology of recombinant dna technology they have introduced a, a gene what is called as the gfp gene okay it is the green fluorescent protein which gives the green color to the zebra fish but this tag can uh, range in different wavelengths so hence you can see you know the color ranging from green to red actually speaking so just look how beautiful they are so this is the beauty of recombinant dna technology you can basically play around with many things of course for the good for the benefit of the society so this is one of the transgenic uh, zebra fishes which is approved by the us uh, food and drug administration at the moment and this uh, this is basically taken this image is taken from a pnas paper in the year 2008 so with that let's move on to uh, what is the definition of recombinant dna technology it is technique by which you can you know join together different dna molecules from two different organisms okay and insert it into host organism i said to produce a whole plethora of different kinds of products which can add further value to what is already existing in the field of science medicine agriculture as well as industry in the preliminary in the beginning of this week i heard uh, uh, a professor speak about you know the dolly the fish and the you know, recombinant rice and so on and so forth so i'm not going to be speaking about that my intention as i said is to uh, give you the feel of how exactly the basic tools of recombinant dna technology has evolved to reach a stage what we have reached today wherein we can produce you know transgenic animals plants etc so i'll go from the backwards so what exactly is the uh, practical goals of rdt what are we trying to achieve so as you can see one thing is we want to develop a basic understanding of what is the function and the regulation of the genes which are already known give me a moment please i want to move this video i mean screen here yeah i think now it's fine so 
In order to develop an understanding of a function and regulation of a gene, I obviously want to first clone it into a particular vector and then prepare it in a large scale so that I can use it for the downstream processing. This is with respect to genes which are already identified. The second most important aspect which I can uh, achieve through RDT is identify novel genes altogether which has not been touched upon at all. And this is really possible. And this is what is essential absolutely for us to uh, you know, progress in the field of medicine and the treatment. The third aspect is to correct certain endogenous genetic defects. <coughs> now, an example of this could be uh, the sickles in anemia, which uh, Dr. Ram uh, just spoke about in the previous talk. The fourth aspect is expressing certain novel genes or foreign genes in disease susceptible hosts. That is basically, I want to make an agricultural crop resistant to a particular disease. Or let's say I want to be able to grow a crop in a condition which is actually not suitable for it. I'm able to do this. In fact, recently when uh, I visited GKVK, it was just amazing for me to see how they are practically implicating what they have studied in the theory. You know, they had uh, different fields, huge plots of fields where they have uh, seeded the crops at the different time points in a year by transfect by transforming or introducing novel genes into it. And they're looking at the behavior of the way in which the plant grows, the crop rotation takes place, what is the yield, the nutrient value of the soils. So, you know, I was really impressed with the practical applications, what is being conducted at GKVK. If you people get a chance, you should definitely visit GKVK as well. So the other aspect is production of protein products for a larger use, okay, so that everybody can access the products. So these are some of the practical uh, applications of why I would want to carry out uh, recombinant DNA technology. So before delving into the entire process of what's happening in RDT, uh, because in order to understand that, first I think we should understand how exactly our DNA is formed, how exactly a gene is expressed and converted into a protein. A brief explanation was given by Dr. Ram, but what I want to emphasize here is the left panel is basically a DNA. As we all know, it is a double helix. It is, a, it is helical in nature and it has two strands which run anti-parallel to each other. That is one strand running from five prime to three prime and the other one is running in the opposite direction. That is five prime to three prime. And the both the strands are held together by basic units of DNA, what are called as nucleotides. What exactly is the composition of this nucleotide? In the background or the backbone of the strands, we will have a sugar, which will be deoxyribose if it is a DNA strand. It will be a ribose if it is an RNA strand. And then you'll have a phosphate group. And both together, they are linked to any one of the nitrogenous bases, which is either a, a G, or C, or a T, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. But what, you uh, what I would like to highlight here is you should make a note of the point that the two strands are held together. One is by the covalent bond, which is much more stronger. And the second thing is the hydrogen bonding, which is seen between the nitrogenous bases and specifically the fact that CG is paired by three hydrogen bonds and AT is paired by two hydrogen bonds, which means to say during a PCR analysis, which I'll just briefly mention in the, somewhere in my slide, if you want to, the more the GC content, the higher the melting temperature that you'll have to apply to denature the DNA for any further processing. So that is briefly about the structure of the DNA. And to my right is the structure of a typical eukaryotic gene. How exactly the information is transferred from DNA and then through the process of transcription to a matured mRNA and from an mRNA to a protein, which is a polypeptide, and then <coughs> how it is uh, modified. So what we can see is in this picture, the first picture, if you consider the first picture, you have regions what are called as exons, exon one, exon two, and exon three, because we have, you know, a lot of genes in the chromosome. 
So how is exactly, let's consider for example, how exactly is this exon 1, which is nothing but my coding region. Exons are coding regions, which will be interspersed in between with these lines. Basically, these lines represent the introns or the interspersing sequences, which do not encode for any protein as such. So of interest for me would be the exons, which makes sense because it is a coding region and it will give me give rise to a protein. So the expression of these exons are driven by certain upstream sequences, what is called as promoter and the enhancer. Now, what is the significance of this promoter? And promoter itself, first of all, has certain core sequences, what is called as the Tata box and the CAT box, okay? Tata stands for thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine, and cyto this CAT is cyt uh, cytosine, adenine, adenine, and thymine, and we also have the GC, which is not shown in the figure here. But the promoter is the region on the DNA which ensures the correct placing of the RNA polymerase close to the exon that you want to express okay so you know this is called it's just like the fidelity of dna replication so okay i'll go one step back just briefly mention dna replication in few sentences so during the dna replication what is happening is the double helical structure is untwining which is mediated by the enzyme dna helicase and then you have the primers which are there okay it's it can follow either the leading or the lagging strand i'll not go into the details of that but those primers will be used as the starting point by the key enzyme dna polymerase now this you'll have to remember because i'll keep mentioning it in the uh, slides which are coming so dna polymerase is an enzyme which will add free nucleotides to the pre-existing primer and brings about the extension of the daughter strands so that's how from two dna strands in the first round the next step you will have two sets, that is four strands of DNA. So that is DNA replication. Now then comes the transcription process in which I was telling you that RNA polymerase plays a very important role and that is correctly positioned close to the coding region with the help of the promoter, especially the Tata box and enhancer is also another region which is ensuring the tight regulation of this transcription. So after that, the information that is the AGCT will be converted into uh, codons. Okay, codons are the building units of the RNA molecules. Now this codon will be converted into amino acids, which is seen in the case of the proteins. But what one point I would like to mention here is because it will help you in understanding when I want to construct a vector, what are the things that I need to keep in my mind? depending on whether I am choosing a prokaryotic system or if I'm choosing a eukaryotic system. So this, what I'm explaining is eukaryotic system. So in eukaryotes, what happens is it's not, life is not as simple as it is in the case of a prokaryote or a bacterial system because the RNA, which is first generated, okay, the primary transcript, what is called as a heteronuclear transcript, it has to undergo what is called as post-transcriptional modifications. What are those post-transcriptional modifications? At the five prime end, you will have the addition of what is called as a cap, that is the methylated guanosine at the seventh position. At the three prime end, you will have the addition of poly A tail. In addition to these two modifications, the introns which I mentioned, which does not make any sense because it's not coding regions, will be removed through a process what is called as splicing. Okay, and there is a separate spliceos uh, spliceosome system machinery which is there in the cells for that. So these are the two major modifications which happens to the primary transcript of the RNA before it is released into the cytoplasm as a matured RNA. Now, why is this required, these, po these post-transcriptional modifications? It's because of the fact that the mRNA, as we all know, RNA is very, very labile to degradation by enzymes. And in the cytoplasm, you have a pool of endonucleases, exonucleases, which can easily degrade the RNA. That's why they say that, you know, when you are involved in an RNA preparation, you should be much, much more careful than when you are isolating a plasmid or a genomic DNA, for example, from any source for that matter, because the half-life is very short and it is subjected to a lot of degradation. So this is one of the mechanisms by which the cell ensures the increased stability or half-life of the RNA. So then from the mRNA, you can see these two uh, codons. Uh, just uh, let's focus only on these two codons. There are several others. AUG basically encode is marked as the start codon encoding for the first amino acid that is methionine. 
okay and then you have the stop codon which is uag now what is the significance of this aug and uag basically marks the beginning and the ending of a reading frame of a gene otherwise what happens is the rna polymerase can sit and it can continuously keep transcribing the entire length without any gap in other words i am not getting separated genes i am not getting separate protein products i'm just getting one single polypeptide but that's now we have evolved right we have evolved through different proteins and how are they generated this is how they are generated because there are reading frames which is marking the beginning and ending of a particular gene then we have the polypeptide which is nothing but the protein they also have orientation as shown in the figure here at the end terminal end you have a free amino group uh, amino terminal group and then you have at the three prime end you have a carboxyl group now one more unique feature in case of a eukaryotic system especially which we have to keep in mind uh, especially for rdt is the fact that proteins uh, mean uh, mean something more for us in case of a eukaryotic system when they undergo what is called as post translational modifications okay now post translational modifications can be addition of any side groups moieties okay it can be glycosylation it can be uh, addition of disulfides as it is shown in the figure it can be acetylation okay so addition of different chemical groups is what is called as post translational modification now why would the cell want to do that that is because we want certain proteins for example to be expressed at the cell surface let's say and most of the cell surface proteins if you see they are glycosylated in nature which means to say I need to mark that particular protein with the addition of a glycosyl group so that it is targeted to the cell surface. There is maybe some other protein which needs to remain in the cytoplasm, something else which has to enter into the ubiquitin pathway, for example. So it basically is helping me target the cells. Okay, so one of the reasons of post translation modification is targeting it to the specific sites within the cells. Of course, there are a lot of implications of post translation modifications. It can also include the level in which a gene is expressed, especially the histones, if you people know. Uh, you know, histones form also one of the unit of the uh, chromatin and the acetylation or acetylation of the histone plays a very important role in generating uh, heterochromatins, you know, whether the gene is expressed or not expressed. So all these are the implications of post translational modifications. Now, why this point becomes important for us in RDT, you will come to know later on when we are using eukaryotic systems. So with that brief background on gene structure and the uh, process of how exactly my gene is converted into a protein, this is the overall view, which I'm sure all of you attending this session, uh, my, my dear colleagues will know that when it comes to how can I generate a recombinant DNA molecule, it's a simple concept, right? I have a vector. I will go into details of the vector uh, in the further slides. I have a vector, I have an insert, I'm basically cutting the vector and the insert, okay, or cutting or cleaving using what is called as restriction endonucleases, okay? And both these cut, my insert is my, this is my insert onto the left panel here. This is the vector into which I would like to clone this insert, <coughs> okay? Clone or insert this particular fragment, my foreign gene into this vector. So, which is called basically as annealing, which is mediated by an enzyme called as ligase. And in the end, I have generated what is called as recombinant plasmid DNA. It is called as a recombinant now because I was successful in introducing this foreign gene into this vector. Then what do I do? I need to select for the positive clones. I need to amplify it because of which I do a process what is called as transformation. Transform the recombinant DNA into a bacteria. Okay, and there is a process for that as well because not all the bacteria are easily taking up any DNA which is done, which is uh, added into the medium. You need to make them competent to take the external DNA. Okay, and then you will uh, plate it out, of course, to select for your clones. There is uh, uh, procedures for that also, which I'll be talking about. So this is the general overall flow of how one can generate recombinant DNA molecules. Now, in my forthcoming slides, I will explain to you what and all was behind you know generating all this 
for which we should understand what are the key tools of recombinant DNA technology and how it uh, was evolved over, over a period of so many years now. So the first most important, which you have already heard, I think, is about the restriction endonucleases. Okay, now restriction endonucleases are a class of nuclease enzymes which cleave the double-stranded DNA at specific sites, not anywhere randomly, at specific sites, okay? And the, they are called as restriction endonucleases. Now, how was this concept of restriction endonucleases itself to, was given birth, okay? So if you can see my figure here, this is a bacterial cell which is having its own chromosomal DNA. And this phage is nothing but a virus which can infect the bacterium. That is called as a bacteriophage. So what the scientists, so all these dates and uh, sentences, what is written here is to show how it, how the discovery of restriction endonucleases itself took place. So what the scientists observed is, uh, there were, so phage is first of all infecting one particular bacterial strain, let's say, that is E. coli. When they did the studies, it was uh, E. coli C strain, okay? So there, the infectivity was very high. Then they take the supernatant of the virus from this E. Uh, from this e. coli C and they reinfect another host, let's say K. They saw that the infectivity was not very efficient. It reduced. And this continues when you passage it from one the host cell to another which means to say the E. coli K is somehow restricting the infection from this particular virus. So that is why that word restriction. So how was it able to restrict the infection of this phage DNA? That is because the host chromosome, the host chromosome or the bacteria, for example, is generating an enzyme, what is called as restriction endonucleases, as is shown in the figure, I mean, the, the second figure here, it will attack the phage DNA, break it down into smaller pieces. Okay, so that is why it is endonucleases. Nucleases means, first of all, enzymes which will cleave any of the nucleic acid. It can be RNA or DNA. And specifically, endo means it is within the sequences. Exo means it is at the terminal regions of a nucleic acid. Endo means it's within the nucleic acid. So that's how the discovery of restriction endonucleases actually took place. Now, who got the Nobel Prize for this entire, you know, demonstration of how powerful restriction enzymes are is in the year 1978, it was Nathan's, Professor Nathan's, because although the initial work was done by Arbor and Smith, they were involved in uh, giving a framework, theoretical framework of how exactly the biology of restriction and modification works, what I just explained. And Smith was the person who first discovered the type 2 restriction enzyme. I'll tell you the classification of the restriction enzymes, type 2 restriction enzyme. And Nathan's is the first person who demonstrated as to how powerful can these restriction enzymes could be, uh, especially when he did the physical mapping using the SV40, that is the Simian virus 40 DNA and its genes. So Nathan's was awarded with Nobel Prize for his discovery and uh, about the restriction enzymes in the year 1978. So Let's talk about how exactly, because now we know there are so many restriction enzymes, how exactly was the names given to these restriction endonucleases? So if you take the simplest example, which is the most commonly used restriction endonuclease in any of the labs is the ECHO R1 because it's very easy. Okay, ECHO R1, if you see the first letter that is a capital E is derived from the genus, okay, Estrichia coli. Uh, I'm uh, Estricia, and then you have the CO is the species name. And then you'll have one, two, three, four Roman letters written like that for all the restriction enzymes. It is only to distinguish them from the different number of enzymes which was isolated from that particular species. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is uh, the nomenclature and shown on the right here is the target sequence. As I told you, restriction endonucleases have a specific sequence on the DNA which they identify to cleave. So if you take example of an echo R1, it has it recognizes a sequence of six bases. That is G, double A, double T and C. Where exactly does it cleave? It cleaves between the G and the A. So these are the examples of other certain other restriction enzymes.
Now coming to different types of restriction enzymes. So initially when the scientists were doing the experiments, what was initially isolated was the type 1 restriction enzyme. Okay. Now type 1 is something which can randomly cleave the DNA. Although it is recognizing the sequences, it does not cleave within the sequence. Okay. It is cleaving at random uh, sequences on the DNA. But that cannot be of much use for the RDT technology because RDT is all about specificity, right? I want to generate a specific gene within this frame only which is possible when I can design a restriction enzyme which can specifically cleave between these two regions only and nowhere else or within that so type 2 is the one which is most popularly used now because it cleaves within or at short specific distances from that recognition sequence okay or from that recognition site so that is type 2 then we have the type 3 and we have the type 4 also now, what is the importance of these cofactors? You will realize when I show you how to experimentally set up a restriction enzyme digestion. So, usually restriction enzymes can be purified in the lab itself, but nowadays nobody has time for it. So, everything is bought from a company. So, when you buy from a company, the kit will tell you to use certain cofactors, okay? That is ATP or it can be MG2 plus or any of these cofactors which is mentioned here. So when it is stating that type 1 restriction enzymes or type 2, for example, echo R1 needs these cofactors in the reaction, it has to be used in the concentration of what is proposed. There is no alternative. Otherwise, you will not get the complete restriction enzyme digestion taking place. I have uh, certain gel pictures which I can uh, show in the next few slides. So let's see some of the features of the way in which the restriction enzymes work so as i told you they have a specific uh, specific uh, sequence which they identify second thing is those sequences which are identified by endonucleases have what is called as an axis of symmetry and only on either side of this axis of symmetry is the cleavage taking place that is what is shown in the top panel here and when it cleaves what exactly is happening it is exposing a three prime hydroxyl group and a phosphate group okay this becomes important because the next step that is a ligation process requires a free phosphate and a free hydroxyl group so it cleaves and it generates a free hydroxyl and a phosphate group the other feature is sequences which are recognized by the restriction enzymes are usually palindromic in nature so when we mean palindromic the sequence reads the same when read on both the strands. So the way we read the strand, first of all, is five prime to three prime orientation. So if you take the upper strand, this is the this is the sequence of echo R1. It is G double A T double T C, and it reads the same when I read on the lower strand G double A double T and C because the strand has to be read in five prime three prime direction. So they are palindromic in nature. The other thing is what kind of cuts do we get when i use a specific enzyme and what is useful for my rdt technology if we take the example of echo r1 which is very famous again as i just showed you in the previous slides if this is two strands of my dna this is the sequence which is identified by echo r1 g double a double t c cleavage is caused between the g and a on both the strands so when it cleaves like this this double a double tc is removed and it generates on both the strands what is called as overhangs okay it generates what is called as three prime overhangs of four bases t t a a a a t and t now what is so special about these overhangs it is simply because any fragment which i cut with eco r1 will generate similar kind of overhangs and because of the Watson and Crick complementarity rules, because of complementarity, when I mix two different fragments, maybe from two different sources, cut with the same enzyme that is echo R1, because of the complementarity, they will anneal, they will stick to each other. Okay, so you can see that this overhang of double T, double A from one source and a DNA which is cleaved with echo R1 from another source having the same kind of overhang will because of the complementarity they will adhere to each other so you can see t pairs with the a so this is what i told you in the beginning of the gene structure t always pairs with the a okay and g always pairs with the c so they will anneal together so that means you are combining them together however 
because the base pairing seen between four bases is not very strong to keep it stable, you want the process of the ligase to mediate the covalent bonding, uh, which will cover the remaining part of the nick. So the nick will be completely sealed with the help of the DNA ligase. Now, of course, as we understood, the sticky ended cuts generated by enzymes make a lot of sense for RDT. But it's not always possible that I just want to use echo R1 or any other enzyme which generates sticky ends, right? Because it depends on the aim of my experiment. It depends on what exactly my insert is carrying or what exactly are the restriction enzyme sites which is available in the vector that I'm choosing. Maybe I want to use an enzyme which will create, you know, a different kind of a cut. For example, on the right hand side, if you see SMA1. Let's say that for my experimental setup, I decided I want to cleave my insert or the vector with SMA1, but it does not generate sticky end. Does it mean that I'm going to stop my experiment? No, because SMA1 is a category of enzymes which is going to cut symmetrically across the double stranded DNA, resulting in what is called as blunt ends. Okay, which means to say I can always combine this with another insert, which creates a similar kind of a blunt end. Okay, so. It's not very efficient for the ligation process as such, the blunt end, given the fact that ligase works better, better with the sticky ends. But nonetheless, it gives me an opportunity that I can uh, clone together two fragments which are having the same kind of blunt ends. So these are the kind of two major kind of uh, uh, ends which can be created when I use the <coughs> restriction enzymes. There is another class of enzymes what are called as isoschizomers, means they are they recognize the same sequence shown in this figure is an example of a set of isoschizomers that is acc 651 and kpn1 both of them have the same recognition sequence ggtacc ggtacc however they cleave with a different pattern acc 651 cleaves between g and g kpn1 on the other hand though it recognizes the same sequence it cleaves between the c and c as a result of which both of them will give rise to different kind of overhangs. Now this again opens up the room for me to combine it with other different kind of fragments. Okay, so this is how, you know, this is a very small part of what I'm telling, but this is how restriction enzymes itself has evolved. And today you can see there is no R&D lab, which will have a four degrees, which is filled with different kinds of restriction enzymes, their buffers and the cofactors and everything, because that is a level with which we can mix and match depending upon the need of the experiment. Now, Talking about how can I set up which uh, an experimental setup for a restriction digestion, which maybe you people will have an hands on experience on. So it's a very simple reaction. We understood that restriction enzyme digestion needs an enzyme. It needs a template DNA. It needs a cofactor. It needs a buffer to maintain the pH. So that will be the component requirements for my reaction mixture. What is shown in the table here. It will be lambda DNA, which is, it can be anything else. It can be a plasma DNA also. Then you have the buffer, then you have the restriction enzyme. You don't have to go into all these uh, small details of the quantity and volumes and everything. But ideally, this is how a restriction enzyme digestion mixture is prepared. One thing one person has to keep in mind is one unit of any enzyme is uh, good enough to give me a hundred percent, you know, efficiency of restriction digestion uh, of 100 nanograms up to 50 to 100 nanograms of the DNA. It is enough to use one unit or even to go for to 0.5 units. Now, what are the kind of samples which I'll have to prepare? Okay, I may want to do a single digest. I may want to do a double digest if it is uh, basically trying to clone out a PCR uh, through PCR process. If I'm trying to clone out the foreign gene which I have inserted, then I will do a double digest using the same enzymes with which I cloned it into the vector. Now, then what I'll do after the reaction mixture, usually the optimal conditions are 37 degrees Celsius. If it is echo R1, which is very, very efficient, 1R is fine. If it is something which is very tedious, it requires certain cofactors such as BSA or anything else, you can do it overnight also. But each one has got its advantages and disadvantages. So after the 37 hour, 37 degrees Celsius for 1R, let's say taking an example of echo R1, 
I need to do what is called as processing the restriction fragments because I need to stop the activity of the enzyme. I cannot just directly use it for the next step of my cloning or whatever it is. I have to stop the enzyme's activity, which I will do by heat inactivating at 37 degrees Celsius or 42 degrees Celsius, depending on the enzyme which I use <coughs> for 15 to 20 minutes. Then I will run it on the gel, purify it, and then I will proceed. So this will be the agarose gel, which I will run to see how effectively has the enzyme cleaved the DNA, how <coughs> efficiently has the restriction enzyme digestion take place. So the lanes read like this. The first lane, what is marked as M, is basically my marker lane. Uh, that is nothing but uh, defined DNA fragments of the known uh, base pairs, okay? So if you take a 1KB ladder, it will run like this with 200, 300, 1000, 3000, 6000 6, base pairs, and then, <coughs> Moment, please. And then I have my different samples. Ideally, it is always best to first run your uncut DNA. Okay, you take your vector as it is without any restriction digestion, you run it on the gel. Now, the next sample should be uh, lane 2. In this example, in this particular example, they have cleaved the uh, example of the vector which they have used here is the PET24A is the vector which they have used. So, my first lane is that uh, PET24A vector. Second lane is the vector being digested with ZO1 enzyme. Third one is the PET24A which is, uh, which is uh, treated with the HIN3 enzyme. Okay, so on single digest with these two enzymes, you can see that they have got a product of 242 base pairs. Okay, so this is my insert which I cloned into the vector. How can I say that this is the insert into which I cloned? Because in the fourth lane, I have the PCR product. Okay, PCR is very, very specific. So I'm using the forward reverse primers, highly specific to that specific region alone. So it will not amplify anything else. So if through a PCR process, I have got the size of insert as 242 base pairs, the same corresponding size is what I'm supposed to expect in my recombinant when I cleave it with the enzymes uh, ZO1 and HIN3. So this is how I'll set up and I'll verify my restriction enzyme digestion. Now, as I said, the restriction and there are certain uh, features or considerations which has to be taken into note when I'm performing an enzyme. Uh, there is something called as star activity. Star activity is an inherent property of the restriction enzymes, which means to say uh, on what is shown on the figure here, for example, echo R1. Okay, the cognate sequence of SO, uh, echo R1 is G double A double T C. But if the reaction is carried out under suboptimal conditions, means to say I'm not following the temperature or I'm not following the pH of the buffer or I have not used the cofactor which they have said, what happens is echo R1 will tend to identify another sequence which is 90% same except for a difference of one uh, uh, base that is T and it will cleave that as well. So I will get a wrong product that is star activity. I can also come across problems of incomplete digestion. I don't get two specific bands. One is my vector, one is my insert. I will get a lot of bands. I can get unexpected cleavage pattern. Why does all this happen? Either, so for example, what we see in the figure here is incomplete cleavage will be, I will get several bands along with the vector. Star activity is similarly, I will get many more bands below this region here simply because either I have used more enzyme and less template or the vice versa and the other factors which I mentioned. There is another uh, factor which can influence the uh, restriction enzyme uh, digestion process that is the methylation. As I just told you, okay, I forgot to mention to you. So if you ask a question to yourself, so I told you that bacteria themselves produce this restriction endonuclease enzymes to inhibit the phage DNA from infecting it, right? That it will cleave the phage DNA. So the question is, how is the bacterial chromosome itself protected from the action of this restriction endonucleases? It can cleave the host chromosomal DNA as well, but it does not happen like that. Why? Because the host bacteria generates another enzyme, produces another enzyme, what is called as uh, methyl transferases, which will modify the chromosomal DNA by methylation, because of which it will become, uh, it is not targeted by the restriction endonucleases. So that is another factor which can influence my restriction enzyme uh, digestion process. Now, 
till now whatever i explained uh, it looks like the restriction enzymes can be used only for the cloning process that is i cut and i insert it that is not the case at all the restriction enzymes are involved in molecular cloning it can be used in dna mapping gene sequencing restriction fragment length polymorphism as well as the sage processes okay so to simply explain okay let me give you a simple explanation for how i can use restriction enzymes for gene sequencing now you know that today the entire human genome is sequenced and many more the, the other organisms such as drosophila is also completely uh, sequenced and for my experiment i have isolated a novel pathogen let's say okay let's say for example the coronavirus itself and i want to sequence the entire uh, length of the coronavirus because i don't know which is the part which is actually giving uh, which is highly pathogenic and is responsible for this uh, easy transmission that we are seeing i want to sequence it so can i take the entire genome okay humans if you take we are around approximately 3 billion base pairs can i take the entire 3 billion bases clone into vector it's impossible because we do not have a vector first of all which can carry that much insert and it's not possible to uh, clone such a big piece of dna fragment so ideally i would want to chop that huge piece of dna into several fragments clone all these individual fragments into different vectors okay basically i going i will create a, what is called as a, you know a library i will do the contig uh, assembly and then i will do the chromosome walking and i will sequence it and how did i break down that huge fragment of dna into so many pieces or clones is because of the action of restriction enzymes so that is one implication the other one is restriction fragment length uh, uh, length polymorphism which i would like to explain with this example okay so for example let's say two individuals okay the top panel represent me and the below bottom panel any one of you in the audience here how can i distinguish both you and me based upon the restriction enzyme length which is generated that is because as just as dr ram said almost all of us have got 99.9% sequence is the same we are varying by that 0.1% that 0.1% variation is because as he said the snp is the single nucleotide polymorphisms and if that variation or polymorphism which is nothing but variation in the base sequence if that happens to fall in the recognition sequence of a particular restriction enzyme what happens when i take the dna from myself and from you cleave it and run it on a gel the pattern that i get is different because of which i'm able to identify me as me and you as you for example if you if you see the top panel there are restriction enzyme sites such as 1 2 3 okay all these things when i cut it with an enzyme i'm getting six fragments a b c d e and f now i take the dna from you and for some reason there is a mutation in the recognition sequence at c so what will happen when i cut with the same enzyme i will not get six fragments i will get five fragments why because the recognition enzyme was not able to recognize its sequence because there is an alteration or a polymorphism in that one particular base there and i land up getting this as one transcript c plus d so when i run it on the gel which is the bottom panel here one will give rise to six bands and in the two you can see that the c is missing and instead i have got a higher molecular weight band which is because both the c and d are occurring as one single band so like this restriction fragment length polymorphism is one of the ways by which we can identify individuals <clears throat> now this uh, graph here uh is basically trying because i till now i am just talking about one set of enzymes which is used in the rdt technology that is restriction endonucleases so enzymes so quickly going through this uh, uh rdt is all about cutting modifying joining the dna what is the requirement i want enzymes enzymes are nothing but catalytic protein molecules which i said can either be purified by myself or i can buy it commercially from the companies there are three main categories of enzymes which are used in rdt one is the dna modifying enzymes okay restriction endonucleases and the other one is the dna ligase enzyme now restriction endonuclease is what i have been talking till now which will cut the dna at defined recognition sequences generates the dna fragments and i can use it for mapping as one of the example the other dna modifying enzymes are nucleases which i told you already endonucleases will cleave within the sequence exo is the one which is cleaving at the terminal ends of the sequence the second one is polymerases 
if you remember in the first slide i explained the function of the dna polymerase it helps basically extend the uh, growth of the second strand when it is all when a primer is already present that is a prerequisite of the dna polymerase in some of the applications they use the cleano fragment which is the bigger larger fragment of the dna pol1 which is having uh, 5 prime 3 prime polymerase and the exonuclease activity okay then there is another enzyme what is called as reverse transcriptase okay for example if i have a virus which is having rna as the genome but i would like to study that and as i told you rna is not stable so i have want to convert it first into cdna so that is happening through the enzyme what is called as reverse transcriptase then there are enzymes which act on the terminal ends of the fragments and which are those alkaline phosphatase pnk which is a poly polynucleotide kinase and terminal transferase so the action of alkaline phosphatase i would like to show you here with this uh, figure alkaline phosphatase is uh, one of the example uh, phosphatase itself means first of all removal of the uh, phosphate group and polynucleotide kinase means addition of a phosphate group now where can i see an implication of this in rdt is for example there is something called as uh, labeling the using the probes to identify your positive clones okay so i told you that i generate a lot of clones right i have done a transformation i have got thousands of clones but among these thousands of clones which is the clone which has taken up my foreign gene one of the methods which i would use for that is the hybridization process for which hybridization is nothing but the two complementary strands binding together for which we use what is called as probes okay probes are nothing but they are labeled oligonucleotides or some short stretch of dnas so for that i want to label the phosphate or the sulfur in the dna so how do i label i will introduce a radioactively labeled uh, phosphor okay instead of p31 i will give it p32 which is a radioactive uh, molecule and how does uh, what is the enzyme that is used for the addition of this uh, radioactive label is the alkaline uh, is the polynucleotide kinase what i said so kinase is the enzyme which will help me incorporate the radioactively labeled p32 in the backbone of the dna which can be identified later on through a process of what is called as auto radiography what is shown in the right panel here okay so this radioactively labeled p32 can be detected through auto radiography auto radiography is nothing but <coughs> when the signals on my gel can be transferred onto a, a x ray film okay nylon membrane or anything and then i develop it and i'll get dark bands on the x ray sheets so that is how i detect the radioactive labeling but of course now uh, this is the most sensitive method for detection because it is uh, very very precise uh, there are a lot of disadvantages with radioactive labeling because of the short life because of the danger which is acquainted with using the radioactive labels it's very very expensive because of which there are alternative methods of labeling the probes as well such as you, you can label it with the fluorescent uh, tag maybe a gfp or sci3 sci5 any of the tags which basically i think i have a, yeah so if you're doing fluorescent tagging of the DNA, it emits a light at a different wavelength than what it is absorbed. And that fluorescence is measured. So this is much better than radioactivity in terms of it's not very expensive. But here again, the loss of signal is very uh, common. If you keep it exposed to the light, you lose the signal. Another method which you can use for labeling is uh, biotin tagged or dioxin. I don't want to go into the details of it. So these are the other different types of enzymes. Now, finally, I have the DNA ligase, which we spoke of, which is the key enzyme, which is helping me join the DNA molecules in generating through a phosphodiester linkage bond generation. And it helps in the final step of, uh, so I have a picture to show how exactly the ligase enzyme works, okay? So in the normal process, you all know, for example, if there is a damage in the DNA, the seal, the nick which is created, will be sealed up with the help of ligase enzyme. Or also during the DNA replication process, okay, when the Okazaki fragments are generated, ligase is the enzyme which is uh, linking all the fragments together. But when it comes to RDT, it's the same process it works. That is, when a restriction enzyme cleaves the DNA, I told you, it generates a free 3 prime hydroxyl end, what is shown here, and a phosphate group. So then what i do i will treat the sample with dna ligase enzyme which uses atp as one of the cofactors and it will transfer and it will form a complex with amp phos uh, it will attack the phosphorus group first the free phosphate group which is there then it will attack the hydroxyl group 
finally generating a functional phosphodiester bond and stabilizes the uh, two molecules which are attached together. Next, moving on to the another important uh, aspect of uh, RDT, which is the vectors. Okay, so vector, if you ask any common man who doesn't know too much about science, he will say, yeah, mosquito is a vector. Because uh, if you see the malaria, the dengue, everything is spread from uh, mosquito from one person to another person, right? So in that sense, mosquito is also a vector. But when it comes to RDT technology, a vector is a DNA molecule which is capable of replicating itself in a host organism also act as a carrier molecule to transfer the genes from one host to another host. Now, there are a lot of vectors. If you take out Maniatis volume 1, 2, 3, you will see it is entire book is filled with about vectors, okay? So, what are certain general features of vectors? Any vector it can be, what are certain unique features? One thing is, it's the small size. Which would, uh, which will make life easy for me to manipulate it in terms of isolation, transformation, and everything. It should be easy to transfer from one cell to another through the process of transformation. Isolation itself should be easy, easy to detect and select. It should occur in multiple copies, which will help obtaining large amounts of DNA. But here, I would like to tell that. Um, okay, I'll show you a figure later. Uh, uh, there is a disadvantage and an advantage when a plasmid vector is used as high copy number. Okay, high copy number, low copy number. Low copy number means you have less number of plasmid copies per cell, which is actually most widely preferred when compared to high copy number. Okay, because when there is high copy number, what happens is sometimes even if the gene is not expressed, the bacterial growth is reduced because all the nutrients are getting exhausted as a result of which the transformation is affected, the yield is also affected. So most preferred version is the low copy number plasmid. Then you, it should have a polylinker region, okay? And then it should have a method to detect the presence of foreign DNA, which is uh, introduced into the vector. Now that being the certain salient features of the uh, vectors which are used, uh, as I told you, there are several categories of vectors which is used. Most common, most simplified version, easy to handle is the plasmid vectors because it is used for all kinds of general DNA manipulations. Maximum insert size, okay? So my life is revolving between what is the size a particular vector can take when I'm designing an experiment to generate a recombinant DNA. So plasmid, if it is a very small fragment of 10 to 20 KB, I will go for a plasmid. It can be examples of PBR322 or PUC18. I'll show you in the next slide. Or if I want, if the aim of my experiment is to construct libraries, Okay, uh, so the, I'll tell you just in one line, what is the concept of library uh, in a whole organism? Okay, for example, let's take again coronavirus. Okay, the entire genome at the moment, I'm interested in knowing about all the genes or let's say the spike protein, which everybody is saying that spike protein is the most important uh, uh, protein, which is uh, giving that infectivity to the virus. So at the moment, I will use restriction enzymes, which will help me isolate out the spike protein alone. Okay, as an antigen to elicit the immunogenicity. What am I doing with the rest of the genome? I'm throwing it away. Now, a few months later, I realize, okay, there is another gene in the same genome, which is actually acting even better than the spike protein. Do I again repeat the process from scratch? Do I again isolate the full genome, restrict the digest, purify and everything? I can avoid doing all this. How? By constructing a library specifically for coronavirus now. In other words, I will fragment it, take each of the fragment, clone it into a vector, and I will create a genome library. Okay, a genome library is nothing but a complete genome of an organism can be divided and it can be saved. That is genome library. We also have what is called a cDNA libraries. As I just mentioned in one of the slides, cDNA means complementary DNA. It is the picture of, it is a picture of an RNA profile which makes more sense to a large extent for us if it is especially not a novel organism. Why? Because I'm interested only in the coding regions. So if I'm interested only in the coding regions, I will take out the mRNA from the cell and I will create a library. If it is a novel organism, which I have no clue about what it is composed of, I will rather generate a genomic library because I need to study every piece of that uh, genome. Then we have cosmids, uh, then we have so on and so forth, phagmid, M13, back, bacterial artificial chromosomes, yeast artificial chromosomes, etc. And their applications are written here. Now, 
so that being the different categories now let's go through what are the salient features of any vector which i take okay what should it have to serve the purpose of uh, generating a recombinant one thing uh, we can compare both the left as well as the right right is basically a pictorial representation of uh, pbr322 p stands for uh, plasmid br is for uh, bolivar and rodriguez the scientist who isolated it and 322 is to uh, number the series of you know the plasmids which was isolated from that particular lab 4361 basically stands for the full size of this vector pbr322 is made up of 4661 base pairs now these other features I will come to first going on to the left hand side. So any plasmid cloning vector, they should have what is called as ORI, what you can see here, ORI or origin of replication. That is the reason in the beginning I explained to you about DNA replication. DNA replication is taking place when the helicase unwinds the DNA at specific sites, what are called as origin of replication, where the replication actually is initiated. Now, without the origin of replication, there is no ways that the plasmid will be able to replicate on its own. Okay, so you need that origin of replication. Now, most of the E. coli plasmids, if you see, they will have origin, the call E1 origin of replication, which was isolated from the naturally occurring E. coli plasmid. And it occurs at around 100 copies per cell, 15 copies, sorry, per cell. Okay, so it is uh, it is fairly good enough for some normal simple experiments. But sometimes, based upon the aim of my experiments, I may want an origin of replication from another organisms also. I'll explain to you that later. So some of the, a basic architecture would involve the requirement for an origin of replication for the plasmid to replicate independently. The second most important feature is the cloning site. Okay, so the cloning site, for example, is uh, so cloning site means a region where I can insert my foreign DNA is what is called as cloning site. So initially, if you consider some of the plasmids, they will have only one restriction enzyme. Okay, and I cannot imagine doing experiments with just a vector having one restriction enzyme because my, that completely will limit the kind of uh, inserts which I can clone. Okay, a everything else is limited. As a result of which, the way the vectors were evolved is they created a site, okay, a synthetic oligonucleotide site on the vector, what is called as MCS, that is a multiple cloning site. So that is what you can see here. You can see this plethora of enzymes which is here. It is basically a multiple cloning site which gives me a wide array of option that I can clone different fragments which can be cleaved with any of these enzymes which is mentioned okay which is what i would actually want than just having one enzyme as in my option so that is the second important requirement that is the cloning site and then after that you have um, what okay so maybe we can look at the left because not all the features are reflecting here so origin of replication is one cloning site is one the other one is the promoter so in the very beginning of the slide i explained to you what is the significance of the promoter if i want to drive the expression of the gene that i'm cloning i obviously want a promoter region and then antibiotic resistance these are nothing but like selectable markers <coughs> these are the selectable markers now why do i need these selectable markers at all because no matter how efficiently you carry out the transformation and the ligation processes it is never 100 percent efficient because of one or the other reasons so if i have a selectable marker in terms of antibiotic resistance gene what is shown on pbr322 here we have ampicillin resistance gene ampr stands for ampicillin resistance gene tet stands for tetracycline resistance gene so these are my selectable markers. So when I clone a foreign DNA into the multiple cloning site here, I will be able to select my clones depending upon the resistance, okay? Whether they have the ampicillin resistance gene or not, okay? When I plate my bacterial cells onto the colony containing an antibiotic, only the positive clones, which is having the insert, will be able to grow because they have the resistance gene, else it will not grow. So that is how one of the methods by which I I can identify the clones. The other thing is the reporter genes. Okay, so you will understand. I'll show you reporter genes means, uh, for example, if you want to study the promoter activity of a particular gene, I can always tag it up downstream with a luciferase gene or maybe a green fluorescent protein 
okay and i can do a luciferous assay by which i can read the promoter activity but these are optional these reporter genes and all will come if you are doing a uh, using um, a plasmid vector for that specific thing general uh, plasmid vectors you don't need all these reporter genes and all if it is a simple experiment then some of the vectors when you take you will have what is called as protein purification tags okay now why is this important on a particular vector protein purification name itself indicates when I have cloned a particular gene, which is encoding for a particular protein, I would want to use it for maybe some in vitro assays. Okay, I want to see if protein A and protein B are interacting in the in vitro conditions that is within a tube. So how can I do that is, I can tag this gene with let's say flag, for example, which is one of the epitopes, and I can uh, tag this one as well with another one, let's say maybe histidine or HA tag, okay? So when I tag these, it gives me an option of purification, affinity purification. I can purify this flag tagged protein using the flag beads. I can purify the HA tagged protein using the HA beads. So now I have the purified version of these two proteins of mine, which I just need to mix in a tube, in a buffer, of course, to see if it will interact. This is the in vitro version that is done in the tube. If you want to do it in the in vivo conditions within the body, of course, you cannot use the tagged versions. You can express it in a cell and you can use it, a mammalian cell, but it will be nice to show it at the endogenous levels. That is, if my endogenously existing protein A, protein B are interacting. This is what the scientists are asking in the end, no matter how much of in vitro studies you show them. So this is an example of recombinant PUK18, which has got a multiple cloning site into which I clone my... my yeah, of interest. For example, uh, purple color, this is the cloned fragment. Uh, now, one more special feature of this recombinant uh, PUK18 plasmid, apart from the origin of replication, which I told you, and the BLA here stands for the beta lactamase or the ampicillin resistance gene. You can see there's one more feature, what is called as LAG-Z actually. Okay, LAG-Z encodes for an enzyme. What this you'll see in many of the vector pictures, if you take, you'll see something written as LAG-Z. So what is it? It is the beta, it encodes for an enzyme, what is called as beta galactosidase. Okay, it encodes for an enzyme what is called as beta galactosidase, which can actually metabolize the lactose. Now, scientists have come up with a method of identifying the positive clones with the help of this LAG-Z as a marker. How do they do that? This LAG-Z here, if you see, is not the entire gene. It is just half of this gene. It's not the entire reading frame. It contains only, let's say if it is a 100 base pair sequence, only 50 base pairs will be cloned but it will be cloned in frame with my foreign gene okay it will be cloned in frame with my cloned fragment as a result of which when i introduce this or transform uh, this recombinant PUK18 plasmid which is carrying the partial transcript of the LAGZ along with the cloned fragment into a susceptible bacterial host through complementation, that is, my host will now complement the complete synthesis of the LAGZ because it will provide the rest of the 50 base pairs. Basically, they are complementing each other and they generate what is called as a functional LAGZ gene or beta galactosidase. So, obviously, and then how do they identify the clones based on this LAGZ is that when I mix these bacterial cells, which have picked up the recombinant uh, PUK18 and treat it with a substrate, what is called as an X-gal, X-gal is usually uh, giving rise to blue colonies if my insert is not there, okay, if my insert is not there. But if my insert is there, then I will give, it will give rise to the recombinants, the positive recombinants will give rise to white colonies. So ideally, the LAGZ will uh, act upon the X-gal, which is actually a colorless substrate, convert it into blue colonies with just the empty vector. But if I have, let's say, cloned my fragment into this region such that I have disrupted the reading frame of the LAGZ because of the insertion of the foreign gene, LAGZ is not functioning anymore, as a result of which I will not get the blue colored colonies, but I will get the white colored colonies, which are my positive recombinant clones. This is what is called as the blue-white screening, one of the other methods which is used for identification of the positive clones. Now, apart from that, 
uh, so you can have uh, the vectors working in two different modes, either at the transcription level or at the expression levels. Okay, so many times my intention in life is not just to isolate a particular gene and put it into another fragment and just leave it at that. There are studies which I want to do beyond that. Only then science makes sense, right? I want to study what is the behavior. The very first application which I mentioned, if you remember, I want to study the function of this particular gene which I have cloned. I want to study the behavior. I want to study how it affects the uh, human cell, for example, or a mammalian cell. I want to study the post-translation modifications which happens on those genes. If that is the case, I would want that that cloned gene be expressed. Expressed means it should be able to convert itself into a protein. Then I will use what are called as expression vectors. Okay. Otherwise, it is called as just the transcription vectors. I just have the RNA. When I want to drive the expression of the protein, I will use what are called as expression vectors, which can be uh, of uh, two types, which I'll show you in the next slide. But if I want to generate a prokaryotic expression vector, what are the requirements? If I want to generate a eukaryotic expression vector, what are the requirements? Prokaryotic expression vector means what I will be able to amplify in a prokaryote, such as an E. coli, a bacteria. The requirements will be the same as we just spoke of. That is the promoter operator. Then you have an ATG start site, multiple cloning site, and you'll have a transcriptor, uh, transcription terminator site. The importance of, uh, you know, the ATG and transcription is to define the reading frame. You'll have a selectable marker. You'll have an origin of replication. When it comes to uh, eukaryotic expression system, I mentioned about the poly A tail addition, right? So we need a region of poly uh, um, you know, a space to add poly A as well, so that my mRNA, which is generated, is a little more uh, stable. And some of the vectors also have these COSAC sequences, okay? For a bacteria, for example, as it is mentioned here, Shine Delgarno sequence is the one which uh, helps in efficient translation. But if it is a eukaryotic system, it is what is called as a COSAC system. So in expression vectors, as I told you, they can be two categories. One is what is called as transcriptional fusions. That is, if the vector is containing only the promoter and I'm dependent on the uh, insert which is coming for the translational signals. That is called as transcriptional uh, fusions. But on the other hand, if I have vectors which are having both the promoter, which is ensuring the transcription taking place, plus it has the translational signals, okay, I have the insert which is coming without it, and then I have the uh, conversion of uh, the DNA message into an mRNA. But here the requirement I have to see is that uh, it should be in frame, okay? The, the promoter and the translational signals and everything, it should be in frame with the coding region of the gene that I want. Only then I'll get the entire transcript. So I think I can skip this. Yeah. So apart from that, so I told you the evolution of the vectors which took place is mainly because depending upon the aim of my experiment, how much of the piece of DNA should I insert actually speaking? So plasmids, if you see, is the most preferred version because it's easy. There are very small fragments which can be done. The yield is very high for me. But sometimes what happens is I want to uh, insert a bigger piece of fragment, which is not possible with the plasmid vectors. So I can use what is called as lambda based vectors. Okay. Lambda based vectors is uh, so before going to the lambda based vectors, how were they used as lambda based vectors? I think I'll just in two minutes mention uh, the life cycle of a bacteriophage. Bacteriophage, I told you, is a virus which infects the bacteria. So when the virus infects the bacteria, it can take two options for its replication. One is it can undergo what is called as a lytic cycle and the other one it can undergo lysogenic cycle. Now, the below panel here is showing a representative picture of a lytic cycle. So, in lytic cycle, what's happening is the phage will come, it will infect the bacterial cell, it will release its genetic material, okay, which is fragmented along with the chromosomal DNA. And when the uh, new virus particles is being formed, that is the packaging is taking place within the head region, it will randomly pick up pieces of the bacterial chromosome. So, that's how it spreads from one organism to the other. But on the other hand, it can choose not to enter into lytic, but it will choose to enter into lysogenic phase where it becomes a prophage. Prophage means it is integrated its gen genetic material into the host chromosome, which is actually what is happening in most of the viral infections because of which, you know, there is, uh, it's very difficult to develop the vaccines when it goes into that integrated stage. So when it enters into the prophage, uh, it, uh, it gets integrated into the host chromosome, okay? 
so these are the two uh, this is the two important aspects of lambda phage now under the lambda based bacteriophage vectors there are two different categories which the scientists have come up with one what is called as insertion vectors and the other one what is called as replacement vectors now i'll tell you the key difference between these two uh, vectors the wild type bacteriophage lambda dna if you take it has many restriction sites you cannot just cut it with hint three once for example it has seven recognition sites for hint three which means to say it will generate a lot of fragments which is not my intention i want to cut it once and i want to clone the gene of interest so what they did in the development of insertion vectors they removed all that extra sites okay if hint three has got seven sites they removed the dna region which had the additional six and on removal the advantage which i am getting is that much piece of extra foreign dna can be cloned into it okay so that much piece of extra dna can be cloned into it so ideally in lambda fudge what is happening is we have a double stranded uh, dna molecule with the two base pairs overhangs on either sides which are sticky in nature and they are called as cohesive ends okay and when you when they infect a bacterial host these cohesive ends they come together they form circular nature with the help of the with the help of the ligase enzyme so this is what is exploited by rdt technology that is i will have those two overhangs that is the cohesive ends and in between i'll have the left arm and the right arm and the central restriction site so they remove the restriction sites in case of the insertion vectors retained only one for example as shown in this figure here eco r1 let's say okay and uh, the other speciality is this eco r1 is inserted in a region of a gene what is called as a repressor gene what is the importance of this repressor gene? Repressor gene is the one which is uh, enabling the phage virus to enter into lysogenic phase. So if I have put my foreign gene using this eco R1, it will disrupt that uh, repressor that is a CI gene because of which I will get uh, clear plaques, okay, with respect to my recombinants. But the parental plaques will be turbid in nature. So the simple logic which they have used is they have removed the excess what is not required from the wild type DNA of the lambda and they have replaced it with the restriction site which they are interested. In replacement uh, bacteriophage lambda vectors, what they did is they have removed completely a big stretch of DNA, what is called a stuffer fragment. Okay. And how did they do that? By introducing restriction sites, uh, uh, so this is also possible in RDT, right? I can introduce the restriction sites also. So you introduce restriction sites, uh, for example, for BAM H1 at two sites, and then you cleave it, and you'll remove what is called as a stuffer fragment, which is around 14 KB, which means to say up to 14 KB, I can put in a foreign gene. So as a result of which, a plasmid vector, which was giving me an option of up to maybe 100 base pairs, 500 base pairs, I have come up to a vector which can give me an opportunity to clone up to 14 KB, which is a big thing. And this increases with the YAC and the VAC, which was used for human genome sequencing actually. Okay. Now, the why all this they did on what basis did they do is the fact that, which I forgot to tell you, the phage head is of a, of a specific uh, dimension, right? Which means to say there is a... Uh, there is the length of the genome which can be packaged into that head is also limited. The size of the wild type one is actually 4.8 uh, KB, 4.8 KB with the 12 base pairs overhangs on either side. So the minimal uh, DNA fragment which is required to also maintain the viability of the bacteria is 37 KB. So up to 37 KB is required for the virus to be alive. All the others is not essential actually. So I can remove that non-essential parts and I can put in my uh, gene of interest into that. So that is the logic behind replacement vectors. Then we have uh, cosmids. I think uh, since I'm running short of time, I will just tell you briefly. Cosmid is nothing but it's made. It's like a plasmid which is made with a combination of features from uh, taking the cohesive ends or the sites, the cos site, what I just explained to you from the lambda phage, so that it can be amplified as a virus particle, and uh, it is other parts is similar to that of the plasmid. I think I can skip this and uh, vectors. Uh, so not all the time my life is happy with just using the prokaryotic or the E. coli system. Many of the studies ultimately has to be done in a eukaryotic system for it to be validated, you know, for it to be converted into a product for clinical trials or whatever it is, right? So I want to move on to a eukaryotic system. So what are the kind of vectors that I can use? So 
one of the vectors which is based is on yeast which is a single cell um, uh, fungi okay it has an origin of replication uh, taken from uh, naturally occurring yeast plasmid which is 2 micrometer origin and it will have a different selection marker because as we know that most of the fungi they are hardly sensitive to any antibiotics so antibiotic selection is mostly done for bacterial when it comes to yeast they have another system what is again the complementation what i explained to you uh, in the previous slides but with the tryptophan gene okay with the tryptophan gene and uh, so we can also use so this slide here basically is showing how can i make use of retroviruses as a viral vector to bring about better uh, you know this, uh, to develop a eukaryotic system basically how i can do that is so on the right what you see is the life cycle of uh, RNA virus. Okay, um, when it infects a bacterial cell, what happens is it has three genes which are very important for the packaging and let's say the integration into the host chromosome. That is a gag pol and the N. And on either side, you'll have the LTR that is a long terminal repeats which is carrying the promoter regions, which are again essential for the transcription of this gag pol and the N. And you have the psi sequence which is helping in the integration uh, also into the chromosome. So what the scientist decided is that they will remove the gag pol and the elv, which is actually uh, very important for the packaging uh, and the infection of the virus. They will replace it with the foreign gene of interest. I mean, my gene of interest, for example. Okay, so remove this region and I will provide my foreign gene. So how is that the packaging of the virus is taking place? How is the multiplication of the virus taking place? That is because I will in I will transfect that plasmid of mine into what is called as a helper cell. Okay, this helper cell is usually provided in trans, which will provide the gag pol and the uh, and the N genes, which is required for the complete uh, packaging of the viruses. Okay, so it is like you know I'm providing one helper virus with other parts. This system is already also there in the plant vectors. That is a TI vectors, uh, tumor inducing vectors. If you people are aware of it, um, for generating the transgenic plants, the it is the same thing. It's like a complementation base. Okay like the binary vector systems in the plants. So I think I can skip this uh, slide because is what I explained. Uh, I would just like to, yeah. So G this is the genomic libraries which I was talking about. So usually genomic libraries makes more sense to me when I create what is called as overlapping fragments than non-overlapping fragments. This is the genomic DNA of, let's say, the coronavirus. I take an enzyme which randomly cuts and it just generates fragments like this. I have no clue which fragment is coming after which fragment. Is this fragment following this, this following this? How can I get an idea what is the sequence of the fragments which I can arrange to make the wild type? That is more possible when I generate what is called as overlapping fragments. Okay. And how can I generate overlapping fragments? By playing around with the conditions of restriction enzyme digestion. Instead of keeping it for one hour, I will keep it for half an hour. Okay. Instead of adding one unit of the enzyme, I will add 50% uh, of the enzyme. So like that, I will not get a complete uh, cleavage. I will get a partial cleavage. But the advantage is I will get the sites which are overlapping by which it gives me a clue as to which fragment comes following which fragment. So that is uh, how they actually generate the genome libraries and is used for sequencing purpose. And uh, okay, this is uh, again, uh, how can I identify the positive clones among the several methods which I have mentioned to you? The other method is what is called as colony hybridization. Let's say, for example, if you consider my light, my right figure here, this is a plate of my clones, which I believe that, okay, all of them are clones, but I want to really be sure which one of this clone is carrying my foreign gene of interest. What I do, I simply take a nitrocellulose uh, membrane. I place it on this plate so that a partial amount of that colony is transferred to the membrane now. And then I will treat it with sodium hydroxide because of which the cells will rupture, the nucleic acids will come out, and those nucleic acids will be copied onto the uh, membrane, right? And I will fix it either with UV cross-linking or with heating. And then I will treat it with what I explained to you in the beginning, that is the probes, okay? RNA probe, DNA probe, which is complementary to the sequence which I have cloned. So when I probe it, if there is a positive clone having the complementary sequence to my insert, it will turn out as a black spot. Then I will go to my master colony plate. I will take out the colony and I will use it for further processing. Okay. 
So the it's in division of the DNA. I can also the most specific method I can do it is by PCR amplification. Okay, I don't I since I'm running short of time, I will not explain in detail, but PCR is one of the method which can be used for the identification of the inserted clones. And there are a lot of applications of RDT when it comes to medical applications, because currently we are in that need of the effective vaccine. Uh, I thought I will mention that you know how uh, RDT can really help in the development of subunit vaccines. Subunit vaccine, uh, a very good example will be the vaccination, a vaccine against hepatitis B virus, which causes hepatitis, wherein they have seen that one specific antigen, that is the surface antigen, HBS surface antigen, is the most important antigen to elicit the immunogenicity. So you just take that uh, uh, gene encoding, that uh, surface antigen. Clone it up in a vector based upon the criteria, whatever we have spoke, and then you develop it as a vaccine. Live recombinant vaccines is wherein I can clone in as many antigens from different pathogens and you know develop a, a multivariant vaccine, for example. Okay, the similar thing is the DNA vaccines. So in the last slide, I would just like to show that biotechnology along with RDT actually has helped uh, achieve all the 17 sustainable developmental goals. Okay, in one way or the other, I will not uh, go into the details of the slide, but uh, that is where bi biotechnology and RDT is standing at the moment, helping us achieve all the 17 uh, uh, sustainable development goals, which is the requirement of the country, I think. So with that, I would like to thank you.